Hi, welcome everyone. A warm welcome to you all. My name is Martina Tanga, she, her pronouns, and I'm the Curatorial Research and Interpretation Associate in the Art of the Americas Department at the MFA. On behalf of my collaborator, Marina Taikenko, we thank you for joining us this, uh, in this program, Before Boston, Black and Native Histories of Place, in connection with the Garden for Boston outdoor installation. This is the first in a series of three conversations focused on Black and Native histories of land and people. Registration is open for the whole series. We begin with a land acknowledgement and recognize that the purpose of this is to build evolving and lasting relationships with our Native communities. I now turn to my colleague Tess Lukey, Curatorial Research Associate and member of the Aquina Wampanoag Tribe, who will give the land acknowledgement. Although we are in a virtual space, we would like to acknowledge that the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, founded in 1870, stands on the historic homelands of the Massachusetts people a site which has long served as a place of meeting and exchange among different nations. As a museum, we acknowledge the long history of the land we occupy today and seek ways to make indigenous narratives more prominent in our galleries and programming. As an Aquinawampanoag member, I am pleased to be able to give this uh, land acknowledgement, but I would also like to acknowledge that I am currently located on the unceded lands of the Nipmuc Nation, who have called this area home since time immemorial, along with many others, including my own community. Thank you so much, Tess. Um, we would love to have this uh, slides advance. Oh, great. So, oh, thank you. So we gather today as part of a series of conversations that give roots to a project currently underway in the front lawn of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. The Garden for Boston consists of two site interventions by the artists and activists, Elizabeth James Perry and Equa Holmes. This spring and summer, and you can already see seedlings being planted, um, they will reshape the grounds around the Sirius Dallin monumental bronze sculpture, Appeal to the Great Spirit with sunflowers and corn, ephemeral plants that are nonetheless part of the endless cycles of nature and long histories of New England land. James Perry's installation, Raven Reshapes Boston, a native corn garden at the MFA, draws on planting techniques used by local indigenous people for thousands of years, centering reciprocal relationships between humans and the land. Homes will plant some 3,000 sunflowers for Radiant Community, an extension of her ongoing Roxbury Sunflower Project, which uses sunflowers to spread beauty and hope through the historically Black Boston neighborhood. Together, Holmes's and James Perry's installations transform the MFA's Huntington Avenue lawn into a growing, blooming summer garden that represents resilience, strength, and hope of both artists, their communities, and their ancestors. Our series of conversations framing a garden for Boston brings historical and cultural context to these installations, digging deep into the forces that have shaped the landscape we inhabit today. Black and native narratives have long been erased or buried as forces of urbanization and gentrification make visible only the top layer of a sedimentary history of Boston and New England. Today's conversations looks to highlight those histories as native and black people are integral to this nation's present and future. We will meet again on June 1st for Community Crossroads, Black and Native Experiences in Boston to learn about current and historical bonds between Black and Native communities from scholars and thought leaders who identify as Black, Native and Afro-Native. And our final online event of this series on June 22nd, planting together conversations with Equa Holmes and Elizabeth James Perry, we will hear from both Garden for Boston artists and this will serve as the official public launch of their projects. We would like to take a moment to acknowledge our funders. Garden for Boston programming is gener 
generously supported by the Carl and Ruth Shapiro Family Foundation with additional support from an anonymous donor. Funding for programming is also provided by the MFA Associates and the MFA Senior Associates. So just a moment um, before we get started, some housekeeping. Before we introduce our phenomenal speakers, I want to give you um, just some Zoom information, although you might already be pros at Zooming as we have all been doing it for so long. Only our panelists will be visible and audible throughout this event. Your video and audio is disabled, but we do hope to hear from you, your comments and questions through the chat and Q&A function. A transcript and closed captions for this program are available through the Rev for Zoom live captions. And lastly, this uh, program is being recorded and will be made available later this summer on a Garden for Boston exhibition landing page. We also want to thank our colleagues, Nadia Hardin and Sophia Walters for their logistical support. Sophia is providing technical support for today's program and please feel free to write in the chat if you need any help today. We really welcome your feedback on this panel and your input uh, for future online programming. And at the end of the, the Zoom webinar, there will be a brief um, survey for you to complete. Now I hand the stage over to my colleague Marina, who will introduce our speakers this evening. Ahoy todos, na anhusi and Marina Tekenko. Hello, my name is Marina Tekenko, and I'm very happy to introduce myself briefly in tomorrow and echo my welcome and gratitude that you are here today. I'm a curatorial assistant in the Department of Contemporary Art, and I have the distinct pleasure of introducing two brilliant women, Elizabeth Salmon and Dr. Jean O'Brien. Unfortunately, Dr. Carrie Greenwich is unexpectedly not able to be with us tonight, and we, are so, we were so excited to speak with Dr. Greenwich who is Andrew W. Mellon, Assistant Professor of Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora, the Track Director of American Studies and Co-Director of the African American Trail Project at Tufts. She has deep roots in Boston and highlights an expansive view of what constitutes diasporic history, New England history, and political history. Martina and I will be sharing some information about her work. And I'll also note that the next conversation will have a strong focus on Black New England history and lived experiences. Building off the work of other colleagues in the museum and our recent Indigenous Peoples Day events, it is my hope that the program today is part of a continuing focus on the people and land who have called this area home and a continuing recognition of the crucial role that Black and Native folks have always played in shaping American history and our shared future. And I'm now going to introduce our speakers. So Elizabeth Solomon is an enrolled member and officer of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. Ms. Solomon advocates on local indigenous issues and has a long-standing commitment to human rights, diversity, inclusion, and community building that she brings to both her paid and volunteer work. She serves on multiple advisory and management boards, including those for the Boston Harbor Islands National Park and Stone Living Lab. She holds a master's degree in museum studies and regularly consults with museums, historical societies, and municipalities and educators to bring the voices, histories, and perspectives of Native peoples and other underrepresented communities to the forefront. She also currently works as the Director of Administration in the Department of Social and Behavioral Health at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She has more than three decades of public health experience and working in both university and community-based settings. Dr. Jean O'Brien is White Earth Ojibwe and is distinguished McKnight University Professor of History at the University of Minnesota. She specializes in American Indian and Indigenous Studies, Native American representations, state and federal recognition, Indians of the Northeast, ethno history, and US colonial history. She is the author of many articles, book chapters, and books, including Monumental Mobility, the Memory Work of Massasoit with Lisa Blee from 2019, and Firsting and Lasting, Writing Indians Out of Existence in New England from 2010, and co-edited the volume Sources and Methods in Indigenous Studies from 2017. She is a co-founder of the and past president of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, an inaugural co-editor with Robert Warrior of the association's journal Native American and Indigenous Studies. She serves as a member of the Board of Trustees for the Cobell Scholarship Fund. And she has won numerous fellowships and awards in support of her work, including the American Indian History Lifetime Achievement Award, in 2014 from the Western History Association. 
Thank you again for being here. If you have any questions that come up while one of our speakers is talking, please feel free to type them into the chat, which we'll be, we will be monitoring. And it is now my pleasure to invite Massachusetts Elder Elizabeth Solomon to speak. Hello. Thank you to the staff of the MFA who made this program possible. I'm happy to see you and members of the audience participating in a program based on the traditional lens of the Massachusetts Bible. 10,000 years ago, Boston Harbor was dry land and we were here. 1,000 years ago, much of what is now called Boston was underwater and we were here. 400 years ago, British colonists came to occupy our land and we were here. Today, what is now known as Greater Boston is a major urban area primarily occupied by others and still we are here. <coughs> Excuse me. We have always been here and we will remain. As I speak about the meaning of this place to the Massachusetts, who are its original inhabitants, I need to emphasize that our connection to this place is bounded by neither time, changes to the landscape, nor perceptions of ownership. Our ancestors who have lived and died here for over 10,000 years are literally part of the land and the water. We do not live in this place, we are of this place. It's interesting for me to be here this afternoon as I regularly struggle with the paradox of telling our stories within the context of institutions that in many cases have fundamentally different goals and values than my own. The description of this event notes that the local histories of black and native people have been erased as a result of the forces of urbanization and gentrification and that the existence of the MFA in this particular place necessarily obscures what was here before. While I agree with these statements, I also believe that when we strive to illuminate previously undervalued Black, Native, and other non-dominant narratives, that is crucial that we also acknowledge the larger underlying forces that in both the past and the present work to conceal them. The area that the MFA currently occupies was one of the areas of Boston that was partially underwater a thousand years ago. It was part of a tidal wetland area that connected fresh and salt water waterways. The only contemporary and obvious remnant of this former water system is an extremely transformed and diminished muddy river that flows on the other side of the road from the museum's Fenway entrance. This extreme change to the landscape was a result of filling in the wetlands to artificially manufacture additional land for constructing buildings that benefit, benefited prominent Bostonians. So one of the forces that obscures non-dominant narratives is the desire to transform and commodify space in ways that privileges the needs of the people of the dominant culture. It is also important to recognize that the concept of museums is Western or European in origin, and that the rise of museums coincides with the era of exploration and colonization of much of the globe undertaken by multiple European powers beginning in the 15th century. From the early beginning of private collections to the major public museums we know today, the underlying goal is both to preserve and display the collection of objects. But the process of gathering collections necessitates the commodification of their objects. And some of these objects were obtained by digging up our ancestors and or separating works from their cultures of origin. So it is within these larger contexts of colonization and commodification in which museums necessarily reside, that we need to consider how our exploration of how Native and Black peoples have shaped this place and how each, this place and each other, and how museums might begin to forefront these stories. First, we must understand that Indigenous cultures frequently have vastly different conceptions of how we interact with the world than that of the current dominant culture. In the case of Eastern Woodlands cultures, we see ourselves as one component 
of a patent of reciprocal relationships that do not advantage people over the other constituent parts of the world as at large. Our cultures and our contributions cannot be understand, understood absent a concurrent attempt to also understand the cos cosmologies and values that underpin our traditional ways of life. <clears throat> Secondly, we must acknowledge that the United States was born out of violence. This country would not be in existence absent the appropriation of native lands and the forced labor of black and indigenous bodies. The practices that started here in Boston and New England formed the basis for later policies as what is, no, as what is, not, what is known as the United States expanded across this continent. We must face both the truth that underlined the build, building of this country and the myths that we tell ourselves about it. So what are some of the intersections of the histories and cultures of Black and Indigenous peoples in Boston? We should first consider the outside forces that brought us together. Both stolen and enslaved Africans and the native peoples of New England are Indigenous people, the first peoples of a place. Enslaved Africans as Indigenous to multiple places in Africa, Native Americans as Indigenous to Americas. Neither of us were allowed to sustain and maintain indigenous cultural practices, nor were we allowed to fully engage with the dominant society. Both indigenous populations were enslaved by colonists and the colonists' descendants here in Boston. Both peoples and their lands were seen as commodities within a transatlantic system of commerce that operated between Europe Africa, the Caribbean, and the continental Americas. This commercial set system was set up to solely benefit Europe and Europeans. Both enslaved Africans and Native Americans fit within a larger system of commodification of both people and land that was instituted by the people that colonized this place. Black and Native Americans were both constrained in their movements and autonomy and the racial categories imposed by the dominant culture changed over time with changes in non-white populations. These changes affected how both Black and Native peoples were and are able to navigate within the dominant culture. However, these common outside forces have led to a long history of interactions and collaborations between Black and Native peoples in the greater Boston area and beyond. For example, nearly 400 years of intermarriage between Native American and people of African descent. This took place both within the greater dominant society as well as within Native communities. One of the best known people within the dominant society is Crispus Attucks, but there are innumerable instances of this that continue into the present. We also participated within multiple conflicts starting in colonial times and often on different sides. Um, frequently our participation of both black and indigenous people made the difference between which side of the war was won and which side was lost. These contributions are frequently neither recognized nor celebrated. In addition, there, if we look more in terms of what's happening more recently, we have continued to be in partnership in multiple social justice movements, including the civil rights movement, movements for land rights, um, ecological um, um, sustainability, the American Indian movement, and most recently, the Black Lives Matter movement. The time that I have does not give me enough time to really kind of talk about the specific contributions that Black and Indigenous people have made. Um, sorry, that Black and Indigenous people have made um, here in the Boston area and um, and beyond. But I would like to think about, or us to think about, where do we go from here, um, and what what role can museums play? and where we want to go. 
So first, I think museums need to work collaboratively with local native and black communities to develop exhibits and pro programming that forefronts our stories and from our perspectives. It's not enough to have a one off occasionally that celebrates either native or African contributions or art. We need to be an integral part of the museum structure. In that sense, we need to really have more people of color, not just Native Americans or Black folks, but basically folks of all cultural groups who are represented in all levels of the museum structure. This will help in terms of actually thinking about what the museum is looking at, what they forefront, what they value. I think also that we need to really work directly um, with communities, um, not, just, not just communities of color, but multiple marginalized communities um, in terms of homeless folks, folks who um, are differently abled, people who traditionally are underrepresented within the museum structure, within museum programming, and within museum exhibits. By forefronting all of these, all of us will be more welcome and represented within museums. And it will, sorry, it will, and, and, and it will make the museums a more equitable and welcoming place for all. Thank you. Wow, Elizabeth, that was so fabulous and thoughtful. And um, I, we don't have any questions coming in for the chat, but I think that's just because you said so much in such a short time that I think I know that I need to kind of sit with it and think about it. And um, again, I'm so grateful for you to share with us. Um, I think on that note, um, we have, I think as we've uh, both alluded to, there's so much more work to be done to build relationships and to kind of keep moving forward. Um, and we do have one chat, which just says so beautifully eloquent from Patricia Lawler. So thank you again, Elizabeth. I'm sure that that people will think about all of the really brilliant things that you've said, and we'll have some questions soon. Um, but I think that probably just in the interest of continuing. We do have one question in the Q&A um, oh, by Christy. Sorry, I can't see that. Um, you, you can, I can read it out by Christine. Okay. Malpica, how can local people help the efforts to become more inclusive as museums in Boston? So I, I think that for me, I think becoming more involved, I mean, going to the museum, seeing if the museum represents you, seeing if the museum feels welcoming to you, seeing if the museum um, represents the communities that you are part of. Um, and if it doesn't speak up, um, I think that, 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 that as I said earlier, museums are intrinsically colonial institutions. <laughs> they just are. Um, and they're not gonna stop being colonial institutions overnight, they can't. Um, so each and every one of us as a responsibility if we see something that we think needs to be changed to say something. We have an, and that's great. Yes, we all play a part in shaping our institutions as workers in museums and as visitors. So that's really well put, um, Elizabeth. Um, we have one more question in the um, chat. Who are museums accountable to? Who should they be accountable to? That's by Sam Lukey. That's really interesting um, because I think I think we have to kind of deconstruct what a museum is. Um, and as I said, a museum is came out of the the exploration and colonization of of the world as a whole by mostly European powers, um, and they commodify their collections by, by necessity. That's, that's just what, what, what it is. And so if you, if you wanna think in terms of, I think that museums really have to rethink 
um, what their role is in society. Um, is it simply to collect things and quote, protect them? Um, and um, in some ways have a curatorial voice and authority to interpret them? Or is it, is it a place where um, that is more responsive, responsive to the communities in which they, um, which, in which they exist and how are they, how do they become more responsible to the community? What does that look like? Um, and, and that's an ongoing conversation. So if you ask me who the museum should be accountable for, it's to the communities in which that they, they sit. And I mean the community at large. And also to think about um, how their collections reflect their values. We have um, a few more questions. I think we'll take um, one comment and one question, and then uh, Marina, should we um, keep going and come back to a few things um, near the end? Um, I thought Andrea Chase says, this is more a comment, your words make me think of Wendy Rose's poem, $3,000 Death Song. So that was a comment. And then, um, John Oat says in the Q&A, while there is a tremendous amount of work to do, can you point to any positive developments or success stories that might help at the path forward? Oh, of course. I mean, the fact that we're having this seminar or this, this, this talk right now is a, a, a really good example of, of movement forward. Um, I think that the other thing that's happening is that um, multiple, multiple museums are beginning to engage with wider communities, not just their um, trustees, not just the people who have traditionally gone to museums. Um, so yes, that, that, that is starting to happen. Is it going to happen overnight? Is it going to be a fast process? No. Um, but again, I think I really do really want to emphasize that this is a, as a group, uh, the things that we have to do as a group and as individuals to make this happen. Now, not, no one person can do it. Again, thank you so much, Elizabeth. And we'll, I'm sure we'll have much more um, time for the Q&A. Uh, really appreciate those, those thoughts and answering those questions. Um, so now I'd like to hand it over to Professor Jean O'Brien. Thank you so much, Jean. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here and I'm really pleased to be on this panel with Elizabeth. Thank you for your wonderful remarks. They were wonderful. Uh, thank you all for being here too. So I'm just going to begin. It, this is kind of, I've been charged with kind of a reflection on the, the scholarship that I've been involved in over the last few decades of my life. So I'll begin. I am a citizen of the White Earth Ojibwe Nation whose work over several decades has focused mostly on indigenous peoples of New England. How did this happen? mostly accidentally, as I encountered a distressing narrative about New England Indians that didn't then and doesn't now make any sense to me. That New England Indians had become extinct in the wake of English invasion, especially because of imported epidemics and warfare in the 17th century. I became preoccupied with that troubling construction in historical narratives back then, and have continued to follow up with questions about one, how erroneous it is, to how it came to be widely held idea in the imaginations of non-Indian New Englanders and beyond. And third, how indigenous activists and public historians such as Elizabeth have taken up the important work of challenging these false and damaging narratives. My first book, Dispossession by Degrees, Indian Land and Identity in Natick, Massachusetts, 1650 to 1790, shows how natives responded to the catastrophe of invasion imported epidemic diseases, dispossession, and more by converting to Calvinism, where they accepted English legal, legal procedures regarding land ownership to defend their rights to homeland, to resist their complete displacement, and to maintain kinship connections and community. My research reconstructed indigenous families and kinship networks and mapped land relations in the colonial context. Over nearly a century and a half, Indigenous dispossession by degrees dissipated their land base in Natick, and individuals and families moved on to other places in their extended network of kin while maintaining their identity as separate Indigenous peoples. 
once made landless, they disappeared from the documentary record because most of the colonial archive that took notice of indigenous peoples involved the bureaucratic processes of property ownership. Despite this sub stubborn myth of their extinction, what vanished was not native people, but rather native land ownership in large measure, which rendered them invisible. Having convinced myself, and I hope many other people, of the dynamic resiliency of the many surviving indigenous communities across New England, I tackled the question of why non-Indian New Englanders deluded themselves into believing the extinction narrative. My second book, Firsting and Lasting, Writing Indians Out of Existence in New England, builds on my first book to explain the need of English settlers for a history of disappearing Indians to secure their claims to the national landscape. I dissect the deeply ingrained myth of the vanishing Indian and analyze the ways local historians narrated Indian history and Indian destinies. I argue that local histories asserted non-Indians modernity while denying it to Indian peoples in imagining the racial terrain, thus arguing against the ongoing sovereign status of indigenous peoples in New England. Insisting on ideas about racial purity, local historians interpreted living Indians as mixed and degenerating and thus no longer still Indian. Notions of blood purity and insistence on cultural stasis, staying the same, for Indians declared that Indian embrace of new ideas, object, practices, and beliefs about modernity made Indians somehow less Indian. Erasing then memorializing Indian peoples as relegated to the past also served a more pragmatic goal, refuting Indian claims to land and sovereignty. Indians did not and have not accepted this effacement, and I detail how Indians resisted their erasure through narratives of their own. I deploy the twin concepts of firsting and lasting to grapple with the settler colonial ideolog ideological project of extinction. Firsting points out how local historians meticulously reconstructed a series of mundane claims about how English colonists were the first peoples, cultures, and societies of worth documenting everything from the first births of English children, frame houses, churches, schools, and so on, implicitly arguing that indigenous peoples, cultures, and societies could not make legitimate claim to modernity and permanence. I couple that concept with that of lasting, a set of claims local historians make about the supposedly last indigenous peoples residing in their localities, claims that refuse to acknowledge the ongoing indigenous presence by insisting that cultural change and intermarriage diminishes Indians to the vanishing point. In effect, this ideological construction posits indigenous peoples as a false starting point for New England. It promotes the idea that Indian peoples and their cultures represented an inauthentic and preferatory history. According to this calculus, Indian peoples did not make history and therefore could not become the foundations of modern nations. By the persistent arguing for a prefatory Indian history of New England, local narrators participated in a seizure of indigeneity from Indians and for themselves. This, thus the claim uttered unironically by non-Indians, I'm a native New Englander, unquote. This seizure in turn depended upon an insistence that incompatible Indian peoples had disappeared or would do so soon. Alongside this fallacy, they constructed what I call replacement narrative the lengthy, complex, and contested history of Indian relations is dispensed with in a series of sweeping assertions that dismisses Indians as long gone, replaced by non-Indians who are making modernity. Local texts attested to a wide range of cultural practices that contributed to this larger message of replacement, namely in the erection of historical monuments, mounting of historical commemorations, excavation of Indian relics, selective retention of place names, and in the land itself one could actually add museums. Ideas surrounding these acts of memory and placemaking participate in the production and reproduction of assumptions about Indians, New England, modernity, and constitute an implicit argument of replacement. The temporalities of race that insisted Indians remained mired in a static past blinded New Englanders to an important fact. Indians resisted their effacement from New England by embracing change to make their way in a changing world as they had done for century and centuries and as they do today. Their ongoing resistance to settler colonialism took multiple forms and translated in their, their survival as Indian peoples. Driven to understanding Indians through a degeneration a narrative about race that insisted on blood purity and coupled with an understanding of Indians as reckoning within this temporalities of race, 
non-Indians fail to accord Indian peoples a legitimate place in modernity. They fail to recognize New England Indians as modern peoples who look to the future and instead constructed a pervasive myth of Indian extinction that still holds so strongly in the imagination in New England. Why did New Englanders have such trouble recognizing New England Indians as such? On one level, their assumption about Indianness that were shaped by the temporalities of race preconditioned them to understand Indians through a degeneration narrative. What I mean by this is that Indians can never be agents of change, but only its victims. Change for Indians means they are somehow less Indian and disappearing. But on another level, they refused to recognize them because it was useful not to. Recognized Indians entailed fulfilling obligations to them regarding protecting their lands and other resources and attending to their needs under a system of guardianship, a trust relationship that had organically developed over more than 200 years of colonialism. During the 19th century and in dialogue with debates over abolition, citizenship and racial equality, Connecticut, Massachusetts and Rhode Island all took measures to officially terminate their recognition of the political status of New England Indian peoples that they still had in the 19th century. This debate took place using the discourse of extending citizenship and or detribalizing Indians for incorporation of them on an equal basis with all others. In effect, New England pursued what I'll call termination to eliminate the claims that can be made by Indians by virtue of being nations, such as the protection of Indian homelands. Individual Indians could remain and be recognized as individuals. Such actions in effect removed Indians, usually cast as colored or mixed or black from an Indian nationhood recognized by the state and subjected them to a narrative that insists that Indians were de degenerate and disappearing. My most recent book, Monumental Mobility, the memory work of Massasoit, co-authored co by Lisa Lee, examines public memorials implicated in the politics of colonialism and appropriation through public history. And it brings my work into connection with both monuments and fine art in museums. It also, I hope, shows how indigenous activists and public historians, such as Paula Peters and Linda Coombs and Darius Coombs, have taken up the important work of challenging these erroneous and damaging narratives like Elizabeth does. Installed in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1921 to commemorate the true centenary of the landing of the pilgrims, Cyrus Stalin's statue, Massasoit, also the, the sculpture of appeal to the great spirit, was intended to memorialize the Poconoco Massasoit or leader as a welcoming diplomat who negotiated the first treaty with the English and was a participant in the mythical first Thanksgiving. But Massasoit, the statue did not remain only in Plymouth. We track the physical and narrative mobility of the Massasoit story through its inception and its movement to numerous locations in the US through a case of nefarious dealings in the fine art market to illuminate how the statute's attachment to national origins did and did not move with the installations. We begin with the question of whether the statute can prompt readers to reckon with the structural violence of settler colonialism in commemorative landscapes, or does it further entrench celebratory narratives of national origins? Our book is connected to that volatile debate, suggesting that monuments to settler colonialism ought to be part of the conversation about the place and meaning of historical monuments in general that we're having so live in such a lively way right now. The historical memories surrounding the Massasoit suggests the rich potential of indigenous public historians to intervene in sanitized narratives of origins. The annual day of mourning protests and a new plaque with indigenous perspectives installed in the 1990s beside the statue change interpretations of Massasoit the statue and disrupt the ritualized Thanksgiving mythology in Plymouth. The daily work of indigenous interpreters and is what, not, what is now called Plymouth Potoxid have long challenged guests over their own implicit false narratives. And the work of Paula Peters and others in connection with Plymouth 400, particularly in the traveling exhibit and videos that are a part of the Our Story 400 Years of Wampanoag History is profoundly important in centering indigenous narratives about New England history. In these and other ways, indigenous public historians are taking up the difficult task of seizing the narrative and asserting indigenous perspectives on the place colonialism calls New England. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. Um, so we want to make sure we have as much time as possible um, to really let this fabulous conversation that we see brewing um, between two really, really wonderful speakers um, happen. But we want to just spend a, a, just a short time pointing to Carrie, what would have been Carrie's contribution to the conversation, we think. Um, right, 
Sophia, could we please share the slides again? And then I'll hand it to my colleague, Martina. But to unmute myself. Um, so in Dr. Greenwich's absence, we wanted to nonetheless highlight some of the important work she's doing. As Marina mentioned, she's the co-founder of the African-American Trail Project with Dr. Kendra Field. It is a collaborative public history initiative housed at Tufts University. This project was originally inspired by the scholarship of Tufts professor Gerald R. Gill, whose work focused on the history of Black people in 20th century Boston. Driven by faculty and student research, the African-American uh, Trail Project maps African-American and African-descended public history sites across Greater Boston and throughout Massachusetts, forming a network of place across time. This project aims to develop African-American historical memory and integration intergenerational community placing present day struggles for racial justice in the context of Greater Boston's historic African-American, Black Native and diasporic communities. And just to point the woman that we see here on their website is Dr. Jessie Gideon Garnett, who lived in the late 19th, early 20th century, was the first African-American woman to graduate from Tufts School of Dental Medicine in the 1920s and the first to practice dentistry in Boston. And Marina will talk about her most recent book. You just do the next slide. Um, okay, great. So this is um, Dr. Greenwich's 2019 book about uh, William Monroe Trotter, who was the co-founder, um, or excuse me, uh, main founder of The Guardian, a newspaper that ran from 1901 to 1950, and was a very important Boston Black Weekly newspaper. Trotter was an extremely um, radical figure, really kind of willing to speak truth to power in terms of promises made after Reconstruction that were not kept. And he oversaw the newspaper at a time when Boston's Black community train changed dramatically, growing exponentially and also growing from the South, from um, elite places in Canada and the UK, as well as all over the West Indies. So um, we really thought that this was such an interesting project to kind of bring in just briefly because a huge component of the project is mapping and also thinking about kind of the way that um, rage can function and have a space for it. And uh, also just the really important layers and distinctions within thinking about something like New England Black history, um, great class divides and how uh, William Monroe Trotter was someone who was extremely elite, but his message really appealed to the masses and not to um, what Du Bois would call the talented 10th. So just wanted to bring that in. And um, Dr. Greenwich has also really talked about the personal element of history. She has very deep roots in the Boston area. Uh, and I think that that both of our speakers today kind of beat me to um, discussing this with the thinking about what uh, is personal about the history and the work that we do. So with that, I'd love to invite all of the panelists back and um, start taking some more questions from you and invite, especially if you have questions for each other. Um, your, again, your presentations were just so thoughtful and Elizabeth, I'm also so glad that you're here having this conversation with us. Um, I do think it's really important for the MFA for you to be here. So um, do either of you have questions for each other before I hand it to Martina for your audience question? Not just no. <laughs> just soaking it all in and um, yeah. appreciating each other's work. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Martina. We have a few questions for Jean that came in already. Um, um, Maria Manteno, thank you for helping us continue to raise awareness into non-dominant narratives. Could you possibly share a myth or story that best represents, in your opinion, the values of Indigenous people? Oh. <laughs> uh, I have no idea how to take that on. Um, I guess maybe I would just point out that 
Many indigenous people have stories about how we are all on Turtle Island as an origin story and how that not only is um, how we are indigenous to this place, but also how we are all related, including in the case of Elizabeth and myself, our cultures are very similar. The histories of our cultures are similar. Our languages are related. Our indigenous languages are related. I think I would just leave it at that. Elizabeth, would you like to answer any part of that question as well? Well, I don't, I don't have a story or an origin story, but um, one of the things that I really talk about is, is more, um, and I can only speak about in terms of um, Eastern Woodlands culture, but <clears throat> one of the things that I help have people help to think about the differences between the cultures as opposed to like really kind of elucidating the entire cosmology of, of all indigenous people, which is pretty much impossible. Um, but, but, but really to kind of think about that, that the dominant culture really kind of, there's a sense of individualism, like, and the sense of individuals or people being separate from the world. It's, and, and that, 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 that people make actions onto the world, onto the environment, onto place for people's um, benefit. Whereas within um, Eastern Woodlands culture, we see ourselves as one component of a big system. We're not the most important component. We're not the only component. And we are responsible for how the, how the system works. So, so, so really, that's one of the ways I kind of um, um, help people to kind of think about how there might be a different way of approaching being in the world, as opposed to being a part of, apart from the world. And, and on the other hand, being just part of the world and a component, not the most important part. So that's one of the ways that I kind of help people think about a different way of approaching, um, you know, how to be in the world. Thank, Thank you, you, Elizabeth. Um, so I also just want to maybe point back to something that Elizabeth said earlier, which I think is an important thing to kind of draw out is there's not an Indigenous perspective. There are many Indigenous perspectives, many different Indigenous perspectives. But one thing that I think really distinguishes a lot of Indigenous peoples from non-Indigenous people is this idea of being part of the land rather than owning it. So it's something that I struggle with when I do acknowledgments is thinking about um, the traditional owners is kind of a, a common phrasing, but it's really, from what I've heard, um, so many different uh, kind of indigenous people's perspective, it's that the, the land made you and you were part of it. You come from the land, there's all these different relationships to the land that are reciprocal and intertwining and not, um, not owning, right? It's, it's a relationship back and forth. Um, so along that note, uh, there's a question from Polly Hansen Grotsky. Do you have recommendations for how each of us can find um, new ways to engage in history? This might be also a museum question too, but engage with children and others um, who are deluded by the dominant false narrative with the ultimate goal of breaking down the pernicious myths that persist. And I would say read um, Jean O'Brien and talk to Elizabeth <laughs> Sullivan, but <laughs> I wonder if you have any other thoughts. You know, I, I would just say, I want to defer to Elizabeth here, but I know that Linda Coombs has been working on projects about creating materials, educational materials for children. I think at all levels, I don't know a lot of details about the project, but I would say, I mean, th that, I mean, I, I, as I said, I accidentally ended up working in New England and then was just, I just wanted to understand more about the story that was constructed here. But these are stories for, for in the indigenous people of the place, first and foremost, I, I, I think. And um, so I've been kind of an interloper and I'm returning home, but there are lots of wonderful people who are, who are working in New England on this important project. I wouldn't call you an interloper, Jean. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like that, Elizabeth. <laughs> So I think there are multiple folks. I think there, there are a number of folks also. Um, the Massachusetts tribe is actually working um, in collaboration with right now the city of Quincy. 
in developing um, uh, basically a pilot curriculum um, for third and fourth graders uh, about the, the original inhabitants of Quincy. So I think you'll people will be seeing a lot more. I think uh, one of the things that's happening now is there's a lot more interest in really hearing different narratives from different cultural groups that are not part of the dominant society. And therefore, um, because of that interest, I think you'll be seeing many, many more um, ways of approaching um, our collective history that is not just the, the, the what, what, what we've been told that has been told and recorded by um, particularly white men. So. Mm -hmm. It, you know, I would also add that um, I, I added the link to our history Plymouth 400 Paula Peters project. That link is to the Plymouth 400 website and it's not the most user friendly. Google her, find her videos. The videos are incredible and they're very, very accessible, I think, to, to students at all levels. And the, the traveling exhibit is, I think it's still traveling. Is it Elizabeth? Do you know? Yeah, I mean, it's profoundly important. And, and actually, you know, a great public history way of introducing people of all ages to, to ways of thinking about a different narrative and a different chronology of this place, <laughs> right? I mean, the first, the first um, video and, and panel was on the 1614 um, abduction of um, Desquantum and, mm -hmm. and 26 other boys and men. So that pushes the timeline back a little bit from from 1620, and of course, it could be pushed back thousands of years before that, as Elizabeth pointed out in her remarks. Yeah, I would say that, you know, one of the things is if you look at the timeline in terms of when Indigenous people have been here versus the timeline of the United States or actually from colonization, it's like, you know, the United States is like <laughs> this compared to this. Yeah, so, so, so really, it, 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 it's, it's very interesting to kind of um, when we start talking about this, I, I think we have to start from um, from from where their interactions took place because that's what people are most familiar with. Mm -hmm. But um, really, to start to understand that the history goes back, you know, over ten thousand years. Mm -hmm. So um, we have two things um, for Elizabeth here. Um, Congratulations for being recognized by MA of Massachusetts for working towards changing the seal. Perhaps could you speak to that? Yeah, I'm waiting for the commission to meet. Uh, we haven't met yet. Um, the, the native folks that are on the commission have met, um, but the commission as a whole has, it hasn't. And for people who aren't familiar with um, the Mass Massachusetts uh, seal and flag, um, it depicts a composite native man um, holding a, a, a bow and an arrow that's pointing down, which is a, is a pose of submission. And on top of the, the, um, the native man's, the native man is sort of in a, in a shield type shape. And then over it is a, man, a man's, arm and hand with a sword in it that is supposed to um, represent Miles Standish. Um, and for folks who don't know, Miles Standish um, was a, a resident of Plymouth um, and was really responsible for a great number of atrocities against Native peoples. One of them um, was against um, the Massachusetts tribe where he went and actually he and his men went and um, and under the guise of sharing a meal um, actually killed a, num a number of a native leader and some warriors and actually brought the leader's head to Plymouth and po posted on a pike where it stayed there for decades. So that's what I meant in terms of when I talk about that the history of this country is violent and that we need to face that history. Um, and so having, having that in a, in a sense, the flag is sort of true to history. Um, I'm not sure that's what Massachusetts wants to be known for. Um, so, so there's been a, a, a 
uh, push for uh, almost 40 years um, to have the, the, the flag and seal changed. And there is now a commission that's looking at that made up of both native folks and um, folks that are appointed um, by different government agencies in the Commonwealth. Thank you, that's such important work for visibility and representation that that history be confronted and reckoned with. Um, there's a few questions in the uh, Q&A for Professor O'Brien. Um, the um, model for the uh, Dallin's Massasoit statue was Thomas McKellar, a member of the black community in Boston and the model for many classical figures in Sargent's murals at the MFA. Mm -hmm. Did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I will comment. We write about that a little bit in the book. Um, I mean, so the story that, that Dolan tells is that Sargent approached him and said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, this statue of Apollo right now, but I'm only using the model in the morning. So if you want to use the model in the afternoons, you should. So that's Dolan's story about how that came to be. Um, but if you talk to Native folks in Mashpee, they're quite sure that Indigenous people were involved in modeling for that statue as well. So it's a more complicated story from the perspective of Indigenous people. Great. Well, thank you again both for that. Um, I just wanted to uh, bring attention to a few more questions. I know we're running low on time, um, but Leila Vermeer, our colleague, asked about if Elizabeth would be willing to speak more about any intersections between your work in museums and public health and how they might relate to issues of place or local histories here in Boston. Yeah, um, they're, they're not directly related in terms of um, um, the actual work that gets done, but again, it goes back to the underlying um, the, the things that underlie where we are. So, so in public health, you're looking at the underlying conditions or it could be a disease, it could be a social factor that actually leads to um, bad outcomes in terms of public health. So it's really looking at systems. It's the same thing with this that I was talking about. You have to look at the systems that underlie where we are if you want to address them and try to change for the positive where, where things are going. So what that means for, for local history or histories of place is really, again, examining um, what underlies where we are. You know, and, and, and you know, my premise in, in this talk was that a lot of it is colonization and commodification. And how does that fit into where we are and how and erasing different narratives. So I'm, I'm not sure if that really answers the question, but really, for me, it's about systems examining the systems and really kind of looking at them very critically to see how we got to where we are. Great. Um, thank you so much, Elizabeth. So this is a question for both of you, asked by Laura Chinez, and then another panelist, um, Melissa Alvarez, kind of asked a similar similar question. And Melissa is actually one of my old students at Brown. So I'm just realizing, and Larissa is currently a student at Brown um, in the MA program. Each of your own work does this, but broadly speaking, what do you think are the best strategies to foster stronger relationships between Indigenous Black and Afro-Indigenous communities, especially in New England? I think recognizing our common struggle, really. I mean, we have we have a common struggle, um, and that that to recognize that and to focus on that rather than on the things that might divide us. Um, so, and and as I said earlier, there's a long history of this. Um, and you can look at me; you can tell. Like, okay, I'm. <laughs> I'm a mix of many things, um, one of them being indigenous. Also, I'm, you know, the descendant of formerly enslaved, um, you know, Af former Africans who were formerly enslaved. Um, so, so really where we have so much in common 
there's so much that has that has that external powers or external forces have brought us together and i think that we can make a huge difference together in terms of really moving this country forward in a way that is positive i'll give one very concrete uh example that draws on something that Elizabeth mentioned, but it's also very local to me, which is the American Indian Movement, which was founded here in Minneapolis in 1969. And it was, it was founded uh, partly, uh, many forces, but, but really importantly founded because of the experience of indigenous people in Minneapolis with police brutality and all, all kinds of terrible policing issues that we've become a spotlight for again in the wake of the killing of the murder of George Floyd last year. And you know, two things I'll say. Well, I could say a lot about that, but I'll, I'll just think. I'll, I'll say two. One is um, the Black Power movement was a model for the American Indian movement about organizing, and these are really with, coping with really similar issues of discrimination and racism and violence. So there's that moment, but there's also the moment of now where, with the demonstrations in Minneapolis that were really, as you, as you know, very profound. Um, there, were, there was a reestablishment of coalitions with African-American and indigenous communities locally. Some people think that the American Indian movement went away. It never did. It's still here. It's still very vibrant. And when the violence was happening, especially in, in actually right around the indigenous, the big indigenous neighborhood, not there are indigenous people everywhere here, but the neighborhood where the, where the cultural institutions are, where urban Indian offices are, the American Indian movement patrol was patrolling the properties and protecting indigenous properties, but not just indigenous properties. Um, that's a very mixed community and it's a community that cooperates to this day. And, and it did around all of the terrible things that were happening here. And um, there's a strong foundation of that here. And, and we have a lot of common in, in terms of struggles across this country and elsewhere. So I would just add that. Okay, so um, thank you again both so much. This was fabulous. Um, I, I wish we had all night, but I think that uh, we need to be respectful of both of your times. Um, before I hand it over to Martina to kind of close this out with some just information about the next few series and apologies to everyone whose questions we didn't get to. Um, we could be talking again all night uh, with these two fabulous speakers. Uh, was there anything, Jean or Elizabeth, you wanted to say in conclusion? Um, both of your talks were kind of microphone drops, so I don't think there's any need for it, but I just want to offer you the space. I just want to say thanks to, you know, to you and the MFA for, you know, for, for having this series. And thanks, Jean, for, you know, for, for participating in this. I, I do remember seeing you many, many years ago at Harvard. So... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I would echo that as well. And it's nice to see you again. I hope I see you before long. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you both so much. Yes, I want to also echo Marina's comments and thank you on behalf of the MFA and um, for also just being such wonderful panelists and speakers. Um, we will, um, so we'll, this is the conclusion of this program. They, um, there'll be a short survey for everyone who attended this webinar um, to fill in about this experience and what you're looking for in terms of online programming from the MFA. This feedback is incredibly helpful for us to serve our communities as best we can. And um, our next, just to plug and uh, remind you all, our next program is um, June uh, 1st, um, uh, Community Crossroads. So we look forward to seeing you all again then. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>